I know it's been a, a, a very uh, uh, intense uh, day, particularly yesterday was a long day, and I know many of you continued to, to work uh, at dinner and other places. Some did not, but uh, many did. So, <laughs> yeah, that's good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, great. Thanks. Um, and so what we, what we often try to do is, uh, is kind of summarize some lessons learned. Uh, because our time is short, I'm, I'm tempted to kind of run through these quickly, um, but then come back to them if we have time uh, for, for discussion. We will put all of these up on the, on the website. Um, from what I understand from Mukul, they'll be up really soon. Is that, is that right, Mukul? Yeah, um, like in the next couple of days or so, really? The, for the slides, not the not so the videos, um, the, they have to do some some uh, fair amount actually of of processing that they do in an incredibly short time. Um, so we'll have these uh, available. Um, I should also mention, and this is kind of in our in our next steps uh, section, that we uh, we do typically try to produce a paper for publication from these conferences. Usually the participants in, in those are the people who are the moderators and the presenters um, of the of the various uh, um, uh, discussions during the during the day. Of course, that presupposes that they do participate in the um, development of the of the manuscript, and so um, you you do have to be active in your back. That's great. Um, you you do have to be you know sort of at least respond so um, that you uh, that you received it and that you're okay with it. So, but we'll we'll go into that in a little more detail in a moment. Um, so, uh, lessons learned. I think our number one lesson and and our closing lesson was that uh, behind every statistic is a patient like Angela. Uh, when we were talking about cases that could be reported, I think um, uh, Josh Denny and Dan Roden have, uh, have that outstanding case on the clopidogrel, uh, the, the patient who had nine stents and restenoses in that uh, before somebody um, actually did genotyping on her and found that, uh, that she was a homozygote, uh, unable to metabolize clopidogrel. Uh, implementing pharmacogenomics um, seems like will will likely only benefit a small proportion of the population for each drug. Uh, recognizing that 95% of us um, uh, have at least one pharmacogenetic variant, probably all of us have uh, at least one, and and there's a, a number of folks who have many, many, and they are probably the ones who end up with a lot more uh, adverse drug reactions. Uh, uh, and I give the, the TPMT, uh, one of the TPMT examples here. And the question that, uh, that I believe Marilyn asked, how do we get clinicians to focus on outliers? Um, we, we do practice medicine based on averages. On the other hand, we all like to think as clinicians that we, we do individualize and personalize um, what we do for patients. But the outliers are the ones that, that get us into trouble as well as the patients. Um, <clears throat> the lesson from the Hong Kong experience of not adequately educating clinicians uh, what to do when you advise them to um, uh, do genotype testing uh, prior to using a particular drug. So an appropriate education effort is, is definitely needed. And um, we heard from Heidi that quality can be vastly improved of, of the uh, quality of the genotyping and interpretation um, by a requirement to s submit to ClinBar and, and undergo peer review, um, as is now, as we understand it, uh, being required by at least one of the major insurers. So before I go on to this, is there anything on here that gives anybody terrible heartburn that we should change? Yes. Not heartburn, but as I, I think about uh, the idea of who will who will benefit from pharmacogenomics, um, I wonder if there isn't some value to knowing that you're a CYP2D6 star one star one, for example. Hmm. As we start to, um, you know, I don't know how many years down the road, and we start to integrate drug drug interactions with uh, pharmacogenetics. You know, a, a drug drug inclusion of addition of a CYP2D6 um, inhibitor like uh, fluoxetine, for example, is not going to impact the kinetics in a poor metabolizer because there's nothing to inhibit. Hmm. Um, the impact will be greatest on those individuals who have the highest activity because they've got the furthest to fall. So, you know, there, I don't know how you measure that I, I, in terms of its value, but um, I, I don't think we should be too cavalier to say that, to say, to imply that there's no benefit to somebody who's not in the in the tails. We we just may not recognize what that is just yet. The immediate benefit for sure is is uh, people in the uh, in the outliers. But as we as we uh, become as we have access to more of the factors and information that make us unique as individuals, it's got to be of some value. 
No, that's an excellent point. You can all watch me try to struggle with a keyboard I'm not familiar with, um, but I'll get it here in a second. And as Josh knows, every time he gives his talk, I always stand up to the microphone and say, 100% of us have pharmacogenomic variants. Mm -hmm. um, because as Steve pointed out, if you're wild type, that in still is informing, uh, you know, dose for specific medications. And so uh, t we, I think that's the message we should be telling. It's the impact is, is more nuanced. But. Yeah, no, that's, and, and I think you've made the point previously, Mark, that, um, that because we dose to the average, and the average includes um, heterozygotes and, and homozygotes for loss of function alleles, that we may be underdosing the people who do not have the risk variant. Yeah, the Warford study has indicated that if you're wild type uh, for all of it, that probably six uh, milligrams is the appropriate starting dose rather than five. So, so and I, I do have to just, I'll call on Jeff in just a second, but I do have to take you to task because I love taking you to task, um, and many of us are, uh, do the same thing. The, the term wild type uh, is, is a, a little bit hard for, for patients to kind of, uh, you know, understand. They, they envision Howard um, last night, you know, having his party and that sort of thing, <laughs> and look at each other and go, are you the wild type or am I? Um, uh, but, yeah, definitely, a badge, but definitely a badge of honor, whatever uh, it is. Yeah, so. yeah exactly, exactly. And so, so, you know, perhaps we need to shift more to terminology like common allele or, you know, in, in the scientific literature, ancestral allele. That's not always the ancestral allele. Reference allele, something like that. So just a little bugaboo I thought I would put in, in your mind. Uh, Jeff Strang? Uh, as to the second, just the way the second uh, bullet is, is phrased, it would seem like it could be phrased in a slightly more sort of positive, like, although for any given gene drug pair might affect only a small proportion of the population, kind of getting to, to Mark's yeah. point. That well, and I mean, and it depends what your definition of small is. CYP2C19, which is one of the most common genes that we have actionable variants, it's 30% of the population. That's not small, mm -hmm. probably. Okay, so how about a subgroup of the population? Is that? I think I'd be inclined to phrase it as the greatest benefit will um, occur in a, um, okay. a, a, a relative a, a subgroup of the population. Fair enough. Um, Remember, he's a pediatrician and a Canadian, so he's going to be a glass half full, uh, full yeah. guy. I mean, or three quarters full. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, I am now officially a U.S. citizen, oh, and this well, last I, oh. election was my first one that I got oh, to. Yeah, live. way to go! Oh, yeah. Good job. <laughs> How'd that work out for you? <laughs> But it is worth noting that, like, I remember when there was a story in one of the Globe articles saying that patient got 23andMe testing and had the warfarin gene, so he made sure his mother wasn't dosed with that drug, right? Yeah. So the, the potential for complete misunderstanding and actually avoiding drugs in people who don't have the risk alleles just because of total misunderstanding, I think is something that we also have to think about. And, and, you know, implementation of genomics to say you don't have that allele, you're good to go, it can benefit the rest of the population too, just something to think about. Mm. Yeah, excellent. Yes? Um, while we're kind of nitpicking on words, uh, can we pick on the word population? And as since that's my livelihood, um, we're talking mainly right now about a European population, and we need to really think about the impact and the health disparity and inequity that face uh, minority populations in even the ability to implement. So we, we wrote this one for you, Manoli, um, but, but also um, um, for all of us, because we, we clearly are not addressing that, you know, people outside the European ancestry population on whom almost all the pharmacogenetic and pharmacodynamic studies have been done. So you're absolutely right. Um, so since I see that we are drifting a bit into wordsmithing, um, what, I, what I would suggest is maybe we, we go past the lessons learned. We, we can come back to them if we have time, because we really want to, you know, capture your energy on research opportunities. Uh, that's, you know, one of the, the major objectives of this meeting is, is what direction should we go in. Um, so uh, we heard the suggestion to analyze early on from Rex to analyze uh, genotype data from past trials. So I might um, sort of pin Dan down a, a little um, and, and just ask the, the, the CAST trial, the cardiac arrhythmia suppression trial, was you know one of the, the major trials showing harm and withdrawal of drugs. And the question has always been asked, is that because of some genetic variant? And could that ever be tested in CAST? Uh, so it can't be tested because the DNA samples, try as we might, are not around. Mm -hmm. um, a, a more interesting question is, could the result of CAST have been predicted? Uh, and I, I, I hate to wait, waste people, 
waste half an hour of people's time explaining why that might or might not be true. Um, but the answer is no, you, you couldn't do that in CAST right now. Uh, and, and the extent to which the genetics play a role in mediating the adverse, that adverse drug effect is, uh, I think there probably is a genetic story. It's going to be impossible to prove, and I can, again, that's another half hour talk. Mm -hmm. But, but Rex's point, I think, was, was you know, is it possible for us to, to get access to some, Rex, I won't make your point for you, you can, you can make it, um, in, in terms of uh, ongoing trials or, or completed trials. This is something we might want to explore. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Um, we also heard about the, the value of patient-driven contribution of, of data and samples, so trying to, to encourage patients to, to contribute such data. Again, how one would do that in the infrastructure for receiving it and, and all of that is, is challenging at best, but it did come out as something uh, from this group, I think, that was something we should explore. Okay. Um, We've heard about harnessing existing quality assurance or quality improvement um, projects for a couple of years now at, at this meeting. Um, we haven't thought of a good way of doing it uh, and would welcome those of you who are doing QI projects as to whether there's a way to, to put a registry on top of that or, or some other kind of a, approach and, and Dick, you know, maybe in your project or Steve in, in yours. Is there, is there any way for us to, to try and capture some of, of that experience that, that can be generalized to, to other centers? I mean, obviously you'll be publishing your, your results. Do you want to comment, Dick or Steve? Maybe not. Let's see. Push your microphone. You need to use your mic. I think what we all, what might come out of this, Terry, is that the more we know about what other people are doing, the more we can collaborate. I've seen that happen in the corridors here. And I assume that's part of what, what you're thinking about. Yes. So we've been approached already by several people who said, uh, are there ways we can work together? And I would hope that, that there'll be more of that. Fabulous. So, yeah. Terry, just, yeah. just to be clear, for UF, for the Clopidogrel project, that was a QI project. We did not have research-informed consent, oh, okay. so it was all done under a QI mechanism. Super. So I think that's a, you know, that's a great example of where you can do a clinical implementation under clinical consent. Um, and with appropriate approvals, then go in and follow up. Yeah, and, and it's fabulous that those are happening. I think what we're, what we're asking is how do we, har you know, is there a way to bring those together, to, to harness them is, a, is the word that we used. Um, and if we can, we can think of some, some clever ways of, of trying to, you know, convene those. I mean, there are quality fora. Uh, Dan, again, has it sort of pointed me towards some quality people at, at your place, um, and it hasn't kind of gotten anywhere. But anyway, so that was, that was one that I think uh, came up as something that we saw as a research opportunity, um, looking at diverse approaches to implement. Can, can I just ask, uh, yes. follow up on that? So um, if things are done under quality improvement, have you gone forward and published any of those? And how do you deal with that issue of publication and dissemination beyond your own Yeah, so we have to, we, I mean, so we have an IRB approval eventually. Um, to do the quality improvement project and then publish. And so, for example, we're given the approval to pull data in a certain date range and then publish off of that. And so we had to keep doing revisions, so we did the first analysis that Laurie presented and then we had to extend our date range. But I think, I mean, I think one of the issues, maybe Terry, to additionally capture is, I think a lot of people don't appreciate that mechanism. They don't sort of understand the how to do that, and it was new ground for us, um, you know, but it's, it's really quite feasible uh, if, if you sort of just sit down with the IRB, and it's a very, I mean, in our center, it's a simple, a simple sort of IRB application. Yeah, and I think um, th there's confusion amongst some that says, well, unless you've sort of set this up on the front end that you can never use data, but the reality is, is that quality improvement projects are not set out with the, the intent of generalizable knowledge, but in the course of conducting it, you sometimes come across very important generalizable knowledge. And so, uh, both at Intermountain and at Geisinger, there's a mechanism by which we can do a sort of an exemption of an IRB just for publication of data um, that uh, is pretty straightforward. But I do know that there are other uh, institutions that do not have that type of a mechanism available. And if it, has, if it wasn't conceived as a research study, they don't allow publication. But you, <clears throat> excuse me, but you can also um, um, 
in several cases uh, uh, request a non-human subjects dec declaration from the IRB because the, if the data are de-identified and they're already in existence at the time of the, uh, uh, of the study. So I, I think there, 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 are me there are mechanisms. Pat, did you have a yeah, I just um, wanted to go back to your second bullet and say, um, you know, I think we really appreciated hearing about Angela Anderson's story. We don't have a, you know, a strong patient presence here right now, but I think if we want to think of patients as, um, patient, as the pool for pharmacogenomics, not just us pushing um, the information out, but as a pool, then I think we don't want to just think of their contribution in terms of data and samples, but I think they can have a much more um, engaged role in, in thinking about um, uh, both the design of research, but also the design up to demonstrate clinical utility, but also the design of implementation research projects. And I know we talked last night about maybe having an entire meeting focused on um, sort of the patient's role in genomic medicine, but I just would maybe think of that patient bullet less in a passive way, but more in a sort of a PCORI way of sort of patient-engaged research and thinking mm -hmm. about um, the design of the research questions and the measures and the implementation of the study, the interpretation and the dissemination of the results, sort of across that continuum. Mm -hmm because I think that they could make a really valuable contribution. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and particularly in pharmacogenomics, I mean, patients get this. Uh, Howard, you've told us in the, in the past that you have patients who will pay for it themselves because they think it's so important. So, um, somebody, Steve? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, for us, the, uh, the, patient, the patient and family engagement is really, really important, especially if you're looking at um, um, studies that are going to follow um, the effect of treatment over a period of time. You don't want to limit your data collection points to um, um, visits um, that may be a month or, or um, three months apart or something like that. And so taking advantage of um, um, apps on, on cell phones uh, is a way of, uh, for example, with an ADHD study, it's a way of collecting information from the teacher, um, the parent, and the, uh, and the child themselves about how they felt they performed at school. Um, and uh, uh, you know, we've got the nutrition people will have uh, people take a picture of their meal from which calorie counts can be calculated. Cool. There, there are different ways to engage um, um, uh, patients and families to get rich phenotype data in a real time and, and like data rich uh, manner. Mm -hmm. uh, but cool. often the, 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 we're not the people who, who know what those are. It's, it's engaging uh, the uh, whoever it is, nutritionists, nurses, whoever it is that sees the patients on a, uh, a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Um, we also heard we should be studying diverse approaches to, to implementation, uh, including uh, not only hospital or specialized center-based uh, pharmacists and clinicians, but also community pharmacists. Uh, one of the things we, we discussed briefly was, you know, should, should there be some uh, meeting of community pharmacists? And Mary, you have a, a colleague who's considering, you know, galvanizing that community, which is a, a very powerful one. Um, should, you know, should we look at using a pharmacogenetic card like a, like a credit card versus a QR code on your phone versus some, some other kind of approach? Uh, we heard from Steve the importance of, of children versus not children versus adults, but differences in children and, and adults, and obviously um, from Anoli and, and Melissa about the differences in, in non-European ancestry populations. Uh, so all of those would be, and they probably it's not only the ancestry, uh, but cultural differences, uh, uh, challenges in underserved populations. Uh, we heard from uh, Lynn Dressler about the, the barriers to, to even, a, you know, uh, what some of us might consider to be a, a low cost test at $200, $250. Um, it depends on your point of view, uh, decidedly. We also heard about requiring, or at least encouraging, use of standardized outcomes across multiple studies so that data can be pooled. We are trying to do this to some degree in, uh, in NHGRI's uh, genomic medicine programs, at least come up with some standard outcomes. I know there are patient-driven outcomes, a set um, from PCORI and, and others, uh, so that seemed to be. Yes? For the uh, diverse approaches, would you include um using different types of technologies like mobile health technologies mm -hmm. and also, um, now I just lost it, but it's not just engaging those particular groups, but how do you engage those groups? Right. right. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's the, more the how than the, than the what. Mm -hmm. Good. And then uh, uh, repeatedly we heard we need other measures of benefit than cost. Uh, cost is, is one driver, but it's obviously not the only driver. 
Anything on here? Yes, Kristen. Yeah, the only thing for the community pharmacist that I would add is I think that it's really a community-based practitioner, whether that's a pharmacist in a community pharmacy, it's a, an outpatient um, clinic, it's a, a you know, physician who is engaging. I think there's a number of diverse groups that are really more community-based than in a community pharmacy specifically. Mm -hmm. I know we see a lot of the clinic-based pharmacists growing in this area to have a, a clinic-type uh, service, uh, consult-type service in an outpatient setting too. Great. Yeah, I want to leave pharmacist on there because I think it's the only it's the only place where we mention you, and, it's, <laughs> and you're you're an important part of this uh, of this puzzle. So, and yes. I don't know if yes. it's uh, on other slides, but I think on their last bullet, I would uh, think that we want to expand to patient reported outcome measures um, as a as a, as one of the measures. Uh, so, and the standardized outcomes or the measures of benefit. Well, I, I guess both. Okay. Um, and patient, well. Yeah, I would just say require use of standardized outcomes, including patient reported outcomes, okay. par parenthetically. Thank you. Thank you, I had writer's block in front of uh, 30 people, including patient reported. Now I have typer's block. Okay, great. Uh, we do have a few more of these, so, so we'll go on. Um, developing methods for studying outliers, I think we, we heard from that side of the table um, about uh, how, do, how do we get not only people to pay attention to the outliers, but how, how does one go about studying them, identifying them, uh, finding them, uh, treating them appropriately. Um, creating a system for pulling together rare uh, adverse drug reactions, uh, pa patients who have suffered rare adverse drug reactions uh, nationwide. Um, we did hear some discussion of the FDA's um, uh, system for doing that, which, which uh, the FDA will, will tell you they recognize this is imperfect. Um, are there better ways for, for trying to identify these, uh, particularly in, in these days of uh, fancy electronic medical records and other things? Uh, Jeff was uh, uh, encouraging us to consider creating registries of, of pharmacogenomic patients. We hear about exomed patients and genomed patients, so, so PGX patients. Um, and, and Jeff, I was going to, uh, sorry, I should have warned you in, in advance, but I know you're up to the task. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on, on what data would be collected and what uses those could be put to? So uh, I think this would be. Um, First of all, in the, uh, in, the, in the usual care environment that uh, uh, sites like the ones around the table, but also a number of the, like the affiliated sites that, that uh, Julie and her team have put together for the pharmacogenetics um, sort of clinical research network, um, are already deploying pharmacogenetic testing as part of their care systems, either as research programs or as clinical care projects. So the idea would be to um, capture um, that vast number of individuals, their um, and, and their clinical outcomes that, are, that occur in the context of usual care, uh, often through the electronic medical record. Um, and I think this is really taking uh, something from the playbook of uh, particularly the cardiology large-scale registries that have been both used to inf um, develop quality metrics by which performance is based, as well as to provide evidence on, on which uh, reimbursement as well as FDA policy have eventually come out. And, and, but this is a, a really long-term uh, sort of play over the next 10 years, not something that I think we're going to reap the benefits of um, in the in the next year or two, but probably over the next five to 10 years. Mark, yeah, I think the other opportunity, although it's a little difficult to imagine how it could potentially work, is to build on uh, a large-scale program like Sentinel, um, w whose intent is to try and determine if there are adverse events occurring with uh, medications in the in, in the clinical uh, practice. And if you could somehow tie pharmacogenomic information into something that looked like Sentinel, um, you, could, you, you, you could then have a very large um, uh, group of patients using a standardized methodology that wouldn't need to be invented from scratch. Um, conceptually, it's fairly attractive, but uh, the operationalization of that would be uh, uh, a nightmare, I'm sure. One potential might be the CDRN network of PCORI. Good idea. Uh, yes, Sandy. Yeah, just as a quick note on that, there is an effort to tie Sentinel to the PMI. Oh, there is an effort to tie Sentinel to the PMI, which may start to provide some of that. Okay. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't that include everything that's been done in eMERGE? Um, 
Sorry, when it term well, everybody who's who's had pharmacogenomic testing. Yeah, but that, isn't that tens of thousands of patients? No, it's, it's, it was it's nine thousand, um, and they're representative for, for PGRNC. For PGRNC, but GWASs have been yeah. done on how many thousands? Right. On, a, on a smaller panel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the, the ability, I think the, the strength of the registries, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is getting updated information on what happens to them long term. That's right, they're continually uh, updated, and, um, and that's the, that is the strength of it, is it's the long term longitudinal data on outcomes. Great. Okay. Cool. Um, there was a, a suggestion that. Um, we shouldn't hold pharmacogenomics to, to different standards from other kinds of clinical care uh, that has been implemented without clinical trials and perhaps uh, trying to compare on a more systematic way uh, pharmacogenetic testing uh, to uh, implementations to other routinely accepted, now routinely accepted testing or new testing that gets added into, into clinical care. So why do those get accepted and this, um, this has more of a problem? I might comment just, in, just parenthetically, we have seen that there, there is exceptionalism in, in genetics and we all decry it, but actually it can be strangely motivating. Um, the, the director of the National Institutes of Health um, tells the story of, of knowing that he needed to lose weight and knowing that he needed to lose weight and not actually doing it until he looked at his uh, genotyping scan and found that he had several risk alleles for type 2 diabetes and that stimulated him to, to lose 20 to 25 pounds. So. Um, and there, you know, there are other examples, I think, of, uh, of uh, genotype-driven trials that, uh, that have had much stronger results among patients because somehow this information to them is more compelling. So uh, providing users with data on which gene drug pairs aren't actionable. So this was the, the no's as well as the yeses, uh, really important uh, topic. And, and Mary and Terry, if you're still here, um, you do have this level C in CPIC. Right, but but they don't get writ up, written up or published. We, we do, but actually, you know, the way that we prioritize which gene drug pairs we write guidelines for is based on um, many things, including user feedback. And so, um, based on what we've heard at this meeting, we'll we'll probably plan to um, survey CPIC members and see if there's interest in moving up some widely used drugs for widely tested genes, which might include some in the ADHD or, or psychiatric um, area, uh, and, and maybe we will move that up and write one of those guidelines. It's something that Terry and I and the CPIC group need to discuss. It'll, it'll move something else out of the queue, yeah. but um, maybe there's bigger priority on doing a couple of no's. The Actionability Working Group of uh, ClinGen um, has um, uh, the same problem, which is, you know, we've adjudicated, I don't know, about 100 genes, which leaves us with 19,900 to go. Um, but one of the things that we've done in terms of the evidence review is that, is, is that the, the, the review, review of the evidence is the real time consuming part of it. And so what we developed was a quick screen where we developed a few sort of screening questions, which is to say, is there any evidence at all? Um, you know, on, on a quick review, um, is, is this something that's actionable? Are there recommendations? And so we can go through genes and we're using it primarily for prioritization, but it, when we have no's on one or more of those categories, we know it's not something we move forward in the queue. And then we can publish to say, we looked at this gene, there's insufficient evidence at this time to move it forward, which is kind of what C level is, but there's at least been a, a cursory standardized review process that's been used. And so it might be a, 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 a compromise uh, given that you don't have the resources to do a full-blown review. Yeah, I mean, that is what I tell people when people come to me and say, should I act on this gene that this company charged me for for this drug? I say, here's our CPIC listing, here's how we categorize gene drug pairs, your gene and drug are a category C, that means there's not enough evidence to act on. And this information that they gave you to suggest that they act on it is not backed up by evidence. But it seems like we're asking for, we're, we're hearing a request for a more detailed review for a few of these, mm -hmm. maybe. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It so sounds like that would be a useful thing, so, okay, great. Um, there was also a suggestion to link national data on, on drug use. Um, I, I mentioned the IMS, IMS, Health, IMS Health. How many are familiar with IMS Health? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, so, so it's a, a large nation, nationwide systematic survey um, of clinicians and 
hospitals, I believe, John, you would know it, you might know it better than I. Uh, but at any rate, uh, very, very useful in terms, that's where you hear that, you know, uh, omeprazole is the, you know, eighth or X most, most commonly prescribed drug in the U.S., that, that sort of thing. But anyway, um, taking national databases on drug use or prescribing uh, and linking that with allele frequency to, to make some estimates of, of um, you know, the numbers of people at risk um, would, would sort of avoid our having to do this in studies like uh, the Emerge PGX or in, in various um, uh, EMR systems or healthcare systems. But then having made that prediction, then those healthcare systems can go in and look and see, well, did they really have uh, adverse responses or not? Just a note about IMS, they, um, they bought or merged with quintiles uh, a year or two ago. So it's not just a data warehouse, but they're actually capturing data from clinical trials, some of which have genomic information. Oh, wow. Didn't realize that. Thanks. Okay. So anything here that people have angst over? And again, you get another shot at these, but just while we have you all in one room, it's nice to get some input. I also wanted to mention that IMS is also starting to collect uh, CPT coding information. So um, when 2D6 or 2C19 or things like that that have tier one codes uh, are being billed for, they're starting to collect that information as oh, well. Cool. cool. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, oh, sorry. So bef before we move on to that, um, can we maybe talk real quickly about a conversation that John really started in our panel um, and continued over dinner and then drinks after dinner? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Wild type. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I, it's not exactly a research opportunity, um, but I, I think as we talked more to John, I think we all got a better understanding of what he was talking about. Um, and so, and so I think, you know, he's really pleading for two things, and I'll sort of lay it out in my words, and then you can fill in the gaps. Um, and, and that is that, um, we have CPIC guidelines that tell you what to do if you have the genotype. He's requesting, and it doesn't have to be CPIC, but that somebody says you should test these, these drugs. And so within ASCPT and CPT, um, there's an effort to develop guidelines for best practices. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity for people in this group or a, a larger group to really sit down and um, develop the set of drugs that we would say, you know, you must test, you know, and, and whether it would be two or three tiers. Um, and I think um, Micheline's an editor in CPT and, and sort of feels like this is, this is a great opportunity. The second, um, again, where the payers are having challenges, and I think the thing is we talked more to John that was really refreshing is we've had payers at multiple, I think there's been a payer meeting here, Ignite has had meet, uh, payers at multiple meetings. And I think we've just never gotten the clarity of input um, from them that we've, we've constantly been seeking. So the second thing is clarity on um, sort of minimum testing within the pharmacogenetics. So, so he was talking about quality and we're like, yeah, but the, you know, we know that the genotyping is of high fidelity and that's not really what he's talking about. Um, and so I think as we talk through, for example, 2D6 versus 2C19, he's like, we have no idea that the, the, those two are different in complexity. So what is the minimum that should be tested? And so I'll just sort of throw out, you know, if you're doing sib 2D6 and you're only testing star four, we would say in a best practice, that doesn't meet acceptable minimal standards, right? So if you are not testing copy number variation in cip 2 d 6 that doesn't meet a minimum standard. So, you know, if we can convene a group that would do those two things and then write a paper, what we're hearing, at least for one major payer, that would make a huge difference in ability to understand what's reasonable versus not reasonable. So I'll let you take yeah. it somewhere. And, and just one other note is that within that paper, we also use that IMS data and that we actually say these are the drugs that this, these genotypes would affect and this is, you know, the amount of people that are on those particular drugs. So again, I, um, I think this is a topic my colleagues at United Health Care, the payer, uh, would be, yeah, I think it's a very interesting point of discussion. I mean, to me, if we can figure that piece out, it hits that second point, which I was making yesterday around, how do we improve the quality in this space? And if we don't know what's getting paid for at a level of precision, then by definition, how do we know quality? So this entire thesis of how do we improve the quality how do we understand what was actually done? I think needs to be a common, my humble opinion, needs to be a common thread 
Um, and I'd love to get some folks together to, to talk about how that comes to life. Great, thanks. With respect to the quality and the conversations we were having last night, to be very clear, it's not only quality in terms of the coverage of, you know, for 2D6, it's a, a variant and a copy number variant. Um, it's also things about the quality of either the genotype calls or the sequencing that was done. So as we were talking, I said, well, you know, so depth is important. Well, we don't have depth in a genotyping array. You have depth in a sequencing assay. Well, is a depth of 20 enough? I don't know, what's your question? Like, what are you trying to find? Um, and so as we started talking, I said, well, with this gene, you really need this technology. And with this gene, this technology is fine. And with this gene, you really need that technology. And he said, payers don't understand or know any of that. So I think if we could, kind of in this paper, put together you know, what you do need in terms of not only the, the coverage of which variants you need, but the technologies to get you there, um, perhaps without mentioning specific companies, because that's not the goal, but it's you need sequencing with reads that are at least this long and depth of at least this. Um, if that can go into this paper, I think it will go a long way for the, the payers to see it and say, okay, this is what the standards are. Right now, we don't have those standards, and we need them if we want things to get paid. It, it may be better to say, because the technologies may change, mm -hmm. so what, it may be better to say, this particular technology at this point in time is adequate for this, and this one has these drawbacks. And actually, the conversation went to where um, if we could come up with what that list looks like and put that in front of some of the technology companies, if they knew that all they would need to do is create a machine that does X, Y, and Z, and that would put them ahead in the market, they might develop such a machine. Uh, until the standards change six months later. Just to remind everyone, we put a lot of effort into this in the um, pharmacogene nomenclature group, and uh, there was no way. <clears throat> It's, it's just, it's an incredibly complex undertaking. So good luck, you're right, that's not CPIC's job. You can definitely refer to CPIC guidelines to see which variants are functional and what their allele frequency is at any given time. But the data always change. Yep, well, and that's... But I think, I think you know, the suggestion was what's the minimum Right, what, what's the minimum for, and, and I think we could go around the room and pick our favorite gene and probably say, if you don't at least have this, you shouldn't bother. Um, and and those, those could be updated, just, just like other things are updated. Yeah, so. I okay. think that would be great. Great, okay. Um, so you'll see, uh, we, we actually separated out things that were not necessarily research opportunities, but more consensus building exercises. Um, we at, at NHGRI love consensus building exercises because um, we get lots of free effort and people come in and, and do things for us um, that, that doesn't necessarily need to, need to cost a huge amount, but can have a tremendous impact on the field. So, um, so something to think about. We'll get to those in a moment. Um, so I, I moved that from the research opportunities into, into the consensus building part. But then we had this Oh, sorry. Are you pointing at somebody, Tejie? Oh, okay. Great. Um, so we had as a fourth objective, and now I'm a little embarrassed that we, we left it on. Um, we had debated within the genomic medicine working group, um, which remember is all the people at that end of the table. So, so you know, you can uh, pick on them as well as uh, anyone anyone else you'd like to for some of these suggestions. But, but we thought, well, gee, maybe we should bring a, a design of a study or a couple of designs to this group and put it in front of you and, and you know have you batted around. Um, decided against that because we we wanted to have a little more free flowing dialogue, uh, but. Given that, we've heard a lot of discussion about strategies for large-scale uh, evaluation and implementation. Um, and we had quite a debate on it uh, uh, earlier this morning, so we don't want to go back through all of that. But I, th I think we'd like to try to capture some of the key points that were made. Um, among them had to do with the ethical questions of randomizing people to no genotyping. Um, and then the point made that, well, you know, given that it's only the 1% that's, that's actually getting genotyping at all, it may be more acceptable in places that wouldn't have any access to genotyping unless they were part of a, uh, of a clinical trial or, or some kind of a study. Um, yes, Howard. I was trying to wait till you were done for that. I, I, I'm, I think it also, by leaving it in there, 
It would also give some framework for a, a, a potential RFA or, or, or something that would allow some of the issues that were raised would be issues that the applicants would have to have a solution for, um, including what sites they use and you know can they randomize and all that. Uh, and so you know, using the Trident, well I don't know if Trident true, but the, the existing you know peer review process that, that we already have at NIH, um, some of these things would be would be filtered in that context. And so I, I would. I'm glad that you've kept it in as objective four uh, because then it'll uh, you know, help capture that part so as we, as we go forward. Because I think at some point in time, it would be good to have that kind of a system, you know, this process versus that process type of study as opposed to this gene versus that gene. Mm -hmm. But you know, that could be argued and has been. Oh, yeah. And will be. Yeah. Okay. Um, we also need to understand better when trials are needed. So when is the observational data, you know, something that one can go forward with, and, and you know, when is it is it something that should be tested? Uh, and as I said, we debated the strategy. It was uh, suggested yesterday that um, one design strategy would be a pragmatic trial to randomize people to genotype guided uh, treatment versus a standard clinical care. And and yet we heard this morning that G for many of the the gene drug pairs that are widely accepted that uh, is of questionable ethics, at least to those in, in this room. Um, so, you know, one, one thing that could be done would be to include a secondary outcome, since, it, since there is that outliers problem. Uh, could you have as a secondary outcome of your trial what happens to the people who are risk allele carriers? Um, and um, uh, I think there was general consensus that identifying people who you know are not going to be able to metabolize a drug and then going ahead and randomizing them anyway is, is probably uh, difficult to, to justify. So would people we'll largely agree with what's up here? I know you all are starting to fade. Um, so, <laughs> all right. Uh, then, then moving on to opportunities for building and, and disseminating consensus. Uh, I think we, you know, have have heard repeatedly we need some standardized terminology for genetic results and and for phenotype designations. And and Mary's group and others have gone a long way in this. But uh, she corrected my my uh, it's solved to it's partly solved, um, and uh, and we probably need some more more efforts in this area. Okay. Um, Heidi had suggested that uh, this, this question of sort of ever-changing panels, that with people, you know, add another variant or another gene to a panel and suddenly it's a brand new panel um, and needs a brand new cost and a new CPT code could be addressed by the approach that's been done in, in some of the monogenic diseases uh, where you basically have a, a minimum set of, of genes and variants that need to be tested for and if a lab wants to add on others, that's fine as long as the cost doesn't change. Carol. Yeah, I just want to go back to the first point, um, which is there's a, there's a difference between standards development and actual adoption. So maybe that's the partly solved part. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of cases where there are well-defined, well-accepted standards, but they simply aren't adopted, especially as it relates to nomenclature. So when it's partly solved, was the was it that the standards still needed development or that the implementation and adoption of the standards still needed development or both? Both, right. But um, as opposed to a lot of standards development where they occur in a vacuum, we're engaged with the organizations that have the ability to actually promulgate the standards into clinical care. And so as we solve the nomenclature problem, we have a, a direct pathway into getting the appropriate codes and LOINC and SNOMED and that that will ultimately are generally used. And so I think we have a pathway that's laid out and so it's more just completing the work as opposed to having to develop that. Yes. Just in the, in the general um, idea, one, one of the ways to compel people to do something is to get the USPSTF, United States Preventative Services Task Force, on board, and that's an uphill battle. Um, but when we're talking about things that are prevention related, uh, in, including adverse events, you may think about that. They have a they have lay out their uh, criteria um, uh, ahead of time, so you can even develop your studies toward those criteria. They have a survey period every year, which I think is either just closed or just about to close this year, where you can say, you know, we think there's enough evidence in this area that you need to review this area. Um, anybody can participate in that survey, uh, and 
uh, and then um, they will probably need some extra expertise in this area. Um, so even if you're not on the push end or you're the developing end, if you can help them with expertise, um, that's one way to do it. And as you may know, USPSTF has some uh, teeth in terms of the current situation with the Affordable Care Act requiring um, grades A and B, USPSTF preventative services to be um, covered. Excellent point. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Um, next, we heard about um, uh, inability to code uh, for, uh, or uh, inability to bill with the, co the codes we have, 200 CPT codes for 65,000 odd uh, tests being a major barrier, and the, the radical proposal from John that uh, that perhaps uh, some new kind of coding approach is, is needed. Um, was a suggestion, John? You want to comment on yeah, that? Yes. So let me just push on that a little bit more. It's to me, it's not just around coding for billing. It's that, I mean, that's part of it. It's also coding for quality. So the payer needs to understand what have they just paid for. Hmm. So to the comment you know, Julie and I had five minutes ago, if there are certain specific alleles that need to be tested, it would be useful to know that. And I, my point is a very simple one. I don't think the CPT structure handles this use case of genomics particularly well, A, given the speed of change, B, given the level of specificity which you'd really like to get. And that specificity is important not only to ensure what has been paid for is the right thing, but also what has been paid for is the right thing of quality. So we use this kind of data not just for the purposes of reimbursement. Um, and we would use, instead of the term billing, we would use the term reimbursement. But um, uh, not just for the purposes of reimbursement, but also for the purposes of quality. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, I would add um, there that my takeaway is is that um, we went beyond developing to actually, uh, com I, I heard a certain commitment to convene the group to do it. So that's number one. And number two is I, we may, in fact, have a solution at hand uh, depending on the genetic testing registry and whether they have unique codes for all the tests that are in fact, registered in the GTR. So we may not have to develop this um, uh, from a tabula rasa. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I, yes, I'm definitely on your first point. I'm very keen to move on, on this thread. Um, but if there's an existing NIH or if there's an existing open source asset mm -hmm. that can be leveraged or extended to solve the problem, I think that's entirely, in my mind, within scope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the genetic testing registry is something that, that we like to think is, is pretty comprehensive in terms of, of available genetic tests, but it's a voluntary registry. Um, and so, you know, one thing to think about is whether uh, payers might want to incentivize um, uh, testers to put their, their tests into the GTR in order to be reimbursed, or that they get reimbursed at a higher level if they, if they are in the GTR. And Terry, can I also say that that would help pull the information out of the EMR? So if you're doing retrospective data and mm -hmm. you want to search, that would really help figure out who's getting those types of tests and drill it down. Mm -hmm. Might it would help efforts like Sandy's with the digitize as well. I mean, I don't want to connect with Sandy on this, but I would also suggest that the use cases around decision support that you folks have been talking about in EMRs are very similar use cases to either a payer or a provider or an ACO are trying to handle. So I think there's the discussion point around this third bullet shouldn't just be payer-based in my mind. It's around decision support, irrespective of whether you're on the payer side or on the provider side. Yeah, I 100% agree. You know, the decision support has to know what test was run or, or hasn't been run. And it needs to, and it needs to know that, if the, particularly if the test was not done in the same institution as you know, the care is happening. I just wanted to make a quick point that I was recently made aware of a new addition to uh, CPT codes by the AMA called Proprietary Laboratory Analyses Codes, or PLA codes. I know next to nothing about them, but just looking at the website, they're an alphanumeric CPT code with a corresponding descriptor for labs or manufacturers that want to more specifically identify their test. Uh, so that might be another mechanism that's already in place. Uh, my understanding is an optional pathway that laboratories can take, um, but could be uh, leveraged alongside GTR. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Cool. 
Um, we, we did uh, earlier allude to our, our lengthy debate on, on uh, randomized clinical trials, but we also noted that there, there weren't many naysayers in the room, and, uh, and should we consider reconvening uh, such, a, such a debate and, and have the people that need to be convinced? So how do you find the people that need to be convinced? I'm, I don't know. Um, the, well, I can get you the slides. Is that right? <laughs> okay. Uh, but clinicians as well as, uh, I think, because they're the ones that have to actually use it. Um, yes. I was just going to say that I think the ones that need to be convinced include the, the authors of the guidelines like AHA, ACC, or whatever gene drug pair. So in that case, it would be, mm -hmm. um, you know, in addition to the payers, it would be easy to identify those key people who, who are thought leaders in cardiology sure. or whatever. Well, it might be fun to, to um, you know, have somebody, one of, one of you, not me, um, write to, to professional societies and say, we think this needs to be implemented now without a, a randomized clinical trial, and then see what kind of a response you get. So, okay. All right, uh, and then uh, other opportunities, um, the building and assuring quality we talked about uh, a little bit earlier, so I won't go over that again. We also talked about some needs in clinical informatics, and, and I should point out that there have been kind of needs identified, you know, throughout these two days. Dan gave us a, a very nice list of them at, the, at, the, at his uh, kickoff talk, but um, at any rate, this is you know, trying to capture those specifically in the clinical informatics uh, realm, um, improving standardization and updating of uh, clinical decision support implementations for a whole variety of guidelines and, and other resources. Um, we recognize that uh, EHR data need to be updatable with new knowledge, so there has to be a way to go in, which is what, Teji, I think we, one of the things you were alluding to, um, is if you know that they've had this test, uh, then you can go back and say, oh, you know, if you didn't even test the star four allele and now we have the star six allele that should be tested, somebody should know that, perhaps. Um, Plugins for drug-drug interaction are, are available, we heard. We heard they weren't perfect, but at least there, there are some. So should. We encourage people to develop some plugins for drug gene interactions, perhaps through our small business mechanism, um, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, is, has been uh, active in the informatics space. Engaging clinical IT personnel more um, in, in grants, providing funding for them in grants so it's a, it was a great idea. Uh, also inviting them to our conferences and programs. Some of you are here, but uh, we could probably use more. Teji? I think one of the challenges for IT personnel is they're usually um, people that are uh, staff of hospital administrations, and mm -hmm. so they can't technically engage in a grant mechanism if you're getting to the nuts and bolts of it. Um, so thinking about how you would do that, bringing in people who would be contractors, mm -hmm. or bringing them on as um, thought leaders if they're at the level of CMIO or something like that. So, and Rex, Rex or Mark, you might want to comment on that because you've done this. Uh. Yeah, and, and we actually have a, a, a group that um, uh, we've had some engagement with. Uh, the American Medical Informatics Association has a lot of interest in this space, and a lot of us are members of that. And so I think that, and, and a lot of the folks that are there have operational roles, but also many times have a clinical research interests as well. And so I think uh, we could um, look to partner with a group like AMIA uh, to uh, get representatives from the groups who are interested in to um, whatever the activity is that we want to. Okay. Yes, Sandy. And I would just say I, I'm actually staff as opposed to faculty and have participated in a number of different um, grants. Um, and I really do think in the community right now there is increased interest. I, I think that there's a desire to figure out how to become more involved. So I think there's opportunity. Wonderful. So maybe we should think about, you know, at the next AMIA meeting, you know, having us uh, proposing a seminar or something in, in this area or symposium on it where we get some thought leaders to, to actually address this. I think part of Teji's comment was that at her institution, they're not eligible to be an investigator. Mm -hmm. it, not that they couldn't do it, but just structurally, some places are easier than others to sure. acknowledge that staff can be major contributors, mm -hmm. it, Good point. industry leaders. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Well, usually, though, that doesn't limit them for, from participating. It just usually limits them from being the PI. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and we heard uh, uh, very emphatically that uh, trying to, to curate manually haplotype phenotype assignments is, is a fool's errand, um, and yet it was what was going on in, in many sites until Marilyn, you and your group uh, began the FarmCat effort, which, uh, which I think we're all grateful for and, and hope that it will continue. Um, but, uh, but trying to do those kinds of things and perhaps identifying other areas. Remember, ClinGen was born out of basically a conference like this uh, where we found out that multiple groups were trying to identify actionable variants, and they were all sitting around, you know, tables like this one and, and going over the same evidence, and largely, but not entirely, coming to the same conclusions. Um, so it seemed like, like trying to harness those efforts uh, made, made a lot of sense and then disseminate them effectively. Um, and then there was the, the, uh, the note that we have also heard uh, repeatedly, the patient is the one constant in, in all of the medical system interactions, and if there's a way for the data to follow the patient, since the genomic data largely do not change, um, that would be awfully nice. But uh, coming up with a system, Sandy, you can do that as your next small project. You're, you're, you have a son who does this, right? <laughs> so it'll probably be a, a several lifetimes before that, that, gets, uh, that happens. Um, other things related to data quality, we need some kind of an infrastructure, again, if the data are going to follow the patient, infrastructure for storage and accessibility of these data, and, and you need that in your institution if you're going to use these data. Uh, right now, and, and still in many institutions, these are PDFs, um, we need to get past that. Dan, were you just scratching, or did you have a comment? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sorry, I meant, Dan, did you have a question? For those who are viewing, you scratching his head. <laughs> so, moving on. Um, it is getting late. So, so also, should we, should we with, in, in regard to the data resources that we heard about, um, sh is there a way that we can aggregate them all or point to them all, um, the, the big pharmacogenomics tools in, in sort of one mega site? You know, the, the one site, as Jeff said, to, to rule them all, um, if there's a way of doing that or at least to link them together. Were there other clinical informatics opportunities that pop into people's heads that um, aren't listed here? I'll just go back to the longer slide. No. Okay. All right. We're almost there, guys. Um, Education and, and workforce development, we had a session on that uh, just, just before this one, and so, so these may be in a little bit wetter clay than, uh, than perhaps some of the, the earlier sessions. Um, but we did hear repeatedly throughout these two days the key role of the pharmacist in this process, uh, the need to sort of grow that group um, in, into the pharmacogenomics space, and many of them are, are quite interested in it, at least that's what we're hearing, and I think, Julie, you're seeing that, and Kristen, uh, in your courses and, and that. Um, and Dick told us how clinicians, you know, those are the people that clinicians contact, and we want to be sure that there are people available to, con to consult. So, so perhaps, as, as Howard described, you know, an extra year, um, and Julie, I think you have a program like this, too. So doing an extra year in pharmacogenomics, people are beginning to see this as a viable career path, um, uh, including nurses and patients in, in education efforts uh, was, was uh, mentioned repeatedly. Uh, engaging community pharmacists is a little bit redundant, sorry. Um, the value of uh, multidisciplinary training, as, as uh, Howard described, what used to be known as molecular tumor boards, um, but now is a clinical genomic action committee, which is a, a great name for it. But, but really the point being that even having trainees being involved in these processes where they, they actually learn the value of the, of, the, of the various disciplines that need to be brought to bear in this area. Uh, the plus one year uh, is another approach for a completed clinical pharmacologist or molecular pathology trainees, and even having sort of various levels of, of uh, potential training, so a one-month possibility, a short boot camp, a, a, a full-year fellowship. Uh, we heard Genomics England, actually it's Health Education England, uh, that is doing this in, in multiple tiers so that you can have a, you know, a certificate. You, you can just take one course, you can have a certificate, you can get a master's degree. There's kind of a, a, a series of possibilities. Um, sorry, there was a duplication there. Um, a lot of discussion uh, toward the end of the day, which is a, a tough time to have discussion, but you all did, uh, on including compelling, compelling case reports that can really gla grab clinicians. Um, the the uh, case that uh, Josh and Dan presented on, on uh, uh, the woman with the nine, nine stents and restent stenosis is something that I heard Josh present probably two and a half years ago um, at a, uh, I can't even remember what meeting it was, but I remembered that slide and I emailed him and I said, Dan, you know, Josh, I really need that slide. It's, it's critical. And by the way, what happened to her? And he said she hasn't had, it's been two years, I think, and she hasn't had another event, which is pretty amazing. So, um, 
Publishing lessons learned in, in implementation, uh, again, something that, uh, that doesn't get into top tier journals, but is really important and, and needs to be done considering webcast cases. Uh, genomic medicine obviously is near and dear to my heart, but for the purposes of this conference, um, cases in, in pharmacogenomic medicine is uh, probably a useful thing to consider. Again, who would do this and how, and that is something that we need to, to uh, uh, explore. But, um, providing a sustained online forum, uh, following courses like the course that you that uh, that you lead, uh, but some some way for people to continue to interact, uh, similar to the the approach taken by City of Hope, um, include clinicians in the design of education programs. Always makes sense to include the learners in uh, what you're trying to get them to learn, and uh, and trying to sneak education. Howard, I thought that was a, the stealth approach to um, putting putting it into things that are already happening, uh, and avoiding focusing on, uh, much as I love the term, uh, le you know, leaving the genome sometimes out of our, our uh, advertisement and publicity material so we don't scare people away, because I, I think we uh, sometimes have had that effect on, on folks. Anybody have any problems with what's up here? Yes, Mark. No problems, but um, there, there is a, a issue that straddles education and, and clinical informatics, and, and we touched on it but didn't stated explicitly, and that's point of care just in time education. So when a physician has to make a clinical decision now, how can we get the information that they need to make that decision into their hands? And so that's, that was part of what I was asking about, but uh, I wasn't very explicit about it. But I think that needs to be uh, articulated as well. So it's sort of point of care education? Point of care, quote unquote, just in time. Okay. education, so giving them the education that they need right at the time that they need to make a decision. Actually, I'm going to save here before something awful happens. Um, Mary, was there somebody else asking a question? Maybe, maybe not. You know, just one additional comment on that. Doing a project like that that involves the, the EHR would also, oh, would, would also have the effect of um, of really driving standards into use. I think that type of thing can really help with standards adoption. The point of care education would? Well, if the point of care education is delivered contextually through the EHR, then you need to get, in order for that to work, you need to receive the data in an appropriately oh, oh, standardized way. Okay. And so now all of a sudden everyone has an incentive to send it to you that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. Makes sense. Okay. Yes. And I think one of the things we've learned that I don't think I articulated well in, in focusing on impl implementation is really focusing on what is it that our target audience needs to know. So you have the incorporating clinicians within the educational design process, but I think it's also thinking about what it is we're actually asking them to do. So we want them to make a, you know, whatever a medical change based on genomic information and making sure that our educational programs are focused on that end um, versus, um, you know, I think it was versus giving them everything in the world they need to know. Well, and I, I remember hearing um, um, one geneticist bemoaning the, the status of, you know, the state of, of uh, medical students and, and junior residents who didn't even know what an intron was. How could they possibly practice, you know, and it's like, why do you need to know that, you know? Um, so so let's, let's try and focus on what's important. Because you don't want to sequence that first. <laughs> and, and they wouldn't be doing that, you know, that's the, that's the thing, so. Okay, other, other points on uh, education? Um, one thing that Bob alluded to is bringing in other types of educators into designing the education. So um, doing a out of the box, I hate that, but um, finding a different way to educate people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't have geneticists doing surgery. Right. Right. So we, we, we need educators to be part, I mean, professional PhD educators to be part of the teams that are designing the effective methods. So clinicians would tell you they are educators, doctor means teacher, but um, some of us are better at it than others. I think though. Well, yeah, yeah, and I think, I, I think in part, it's, part it's about the, techn the, the techniques sure. and, and, and what's work working currently and what the evidence is behind from an educational standpoint. Right. And then also, you mentioned adult learners. So how do you teach an adult hmm. stuff in different ways? Because everyone learns differently. So mm -hmm. sometimes we have to step out. And and I think ISCC is very good in facilitating that. The meeting that I mentioned that really focused on short snippets of kind of educational best practices and genomics from uh, various associations, there was so much within that content that was really just good educational design and adult learning. Um, and so I think, I think CME does a, a really good job from an association standpoint of, of really 
considering that in the design. And there's there were some great, great just techniques. Yeah, and I'm not saying that physicians can't un, can't learn how to do that, um, but if you're going to look at every single specialty and every single specialty society and, and say, do the physicians who rotate through their CME committees all know how to do that well, I would say probably no. not. No. Absolutely. Okay. Great. I wanted to leave a, a little bit of time for, for a last question that was, that was posed to us by John, and, and I, I have said to him personally and, and will say uh, more broadly, it has been incredibly valuable having your voice at the table. And if you guys know of other, because, you know, John can't come to Minneapolis, I can't come from Minneapolis for every one of our conferences, but if you all know of people like him, and many thanks to Dick for, for suggesting we include him, um, we would very much like to have this voice at the table because I think we've seen how valuable it is. Um, so he asked us the question, um, so let's see, what is the sort of one, three, and five year, John, you should ask your question, uh, but this is how I captured it. I don't think you captured it well. What is the one, three, and five year projection for PGX implementation? Also reframe the smartest people in America are around this table right now. Where, what do you folks see happening one year out, three years out, five years out. What, how do you t see the technology and the science evolving? So in other words, if you're in software development, you'd say, paint me a roadmap. Help me understand. Now, that's a little bit of gazing into a, into a ball. But it's a useful exercise because it starts to think about how this could meaningfully impact the system. And subsequently, folks, whether they're on the payer side or the provider side or in life sciences, don't get surprised by the technologies. They can start talking about them at a much earlier stage in there in their thinking as they do their own internal business plans. Mark? So I would break that out into, you know, a couple of different things that you'd want to project over at that timeline. One is availability of the data. Um, and I think we could anticipate that there's going to be some type of an acceleration of the availability of the data over that time. You know, the second question is then is the use of the data, uh, you know, in evidence-based ways, which will presumably lag behind to some significant degree. Um, and then um, the, uh, the thing that probably won't be accomplished, um, at least other than perhaps to build the systems, would be uh, you know, out capturing, capturing the outcomes from the implementation. So I, I would see those, those things as being um, sort of the foundational elements. And those things are going to be different. So for, for my organization, I'm going to have available data uh, in a very short period of time. So m under a one-year time frame, I'm going to have PGX data on 90,000 patients that, assuming we can figure out some of the issues of how to do the validation, we'll be able to use. Um, so then the question is, is how do we actually implement that, uh, which is probably going to be more in the three-year time frame. And my hope would be at the same time that we're looking at the implementation, we're also defining the outcomes and building the mechanisms to capture those outcomes. So at five years, I would have, you know, one to two years of outcomes data related to the implementation. So that's how I would look at this for my specific organization. So, so I wonder, that, that is one way of, of looking at it. I, I wonder if another is to say, you know, what do we think is, is going to be happening in clinical care five years right. from now? Um, and, and, you know, we, we can all have our, our views of, of that. Uh, John originally asked us for what we think will happen in 10 years, and, and I've been saying, as have s several others, that in 10 years everybody will have gen whole genome sequence in their medical record. We've been saying that for about five years now, um, but, but even so. Um, but, but, yeah, five years from now, do, do we think that, that there's going to be um, uh, pharmacogenetic sequencing is going to be, sorry, uh, pharmacogenetic testing at least for major gene drug pairs, et cetera, is going to be standard of care? I kind of think it probably will be in five years. Um, but I could be just a cockeyed optimist, Bob. Well, I think one, one trend that, that we has been alluded to that we need to be aware of is, um, is patients getting their own testing done mm -hmm. um, outside. And what is the workflow when a patient comes to their primary care provider with a list of 20 variants, maybe 10 of which are actionable? Um, what, what do they do with that information? 
Um, so, so just to push on that, so one, one thesis here is to break it down, like, like Mark said, look at it from a technology lens, right? I think that's important. Mm -hmm. I think you also want to break it down from a consumer lens. You know, is, is, is there going to be a new PGX company doing consumer-based testing? I don't know. That's, um, the other lens would be to look at it by the disease state. And again, I'm, you folks will know this much better than I do. I'm not, I'm certainly not a, 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 I'm technically deep in this domain, but it, is it going to be more impactful in certain clinical conditions than in other clinical conditions? That's a useful thing to know. And I think visibility to that maybe outside of this community is limited. Mm -hmm. So if you can help in that journey, in painting this picture, I, I think that would be really useful. You, you, get, you had three lenses, John, and I only got, I only got two of them. What, do you remember? So I had a technology one, which technology. Is, to me is Mark's piece. I mean, I meant that Mark's talking more than technology, so maybe I shouldn't technology call it technology, but technology and data. I think there's a consumer piece to this. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a, uh, there's a disease specific lens. Mm -hmm. um, you could, we, probably some thought needs to be done to think about how you would break this down into meaningful chunks. But off the top of my head, those look fair. Mm -hmm. How do people feel about that? Howard. I, I, I agree with that. I think there's a, a caveat with the disease specific is that there's certain areas, a solid organ transplant, uh, probably cardiovascular disease, psychiatry, where there's uh, enough data emerging that it'll become useful, if nothing else, to weed out some options as you try to choose from the buffet of, of possible treatments. But then there's some areas, very big areas, like diabetes, that I would argue, and someone may hit me for this, but I, I would argue that there is not even enough research going on that it's possible that we'll have enough data in five years. Uh, and you know, who knows about 10, but you know, if there were studies going on today that I thought would answer that question, then maybe in five years we'd have it. But the studies that I'm aware of today are not gonna answer that question. They're still trying to find a gene that might be associated with something. Um, and so looking out for those diseases I don't think, and, that, you know, and then that's a wonderful place where there's, was there seven different types of treatment? 13. It'd be 13 now? No, not 13. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it'd be great to be able to choose from amongst those various options, but yet the data is not even being generated to start that, in my personal view. So my personal view is to disagree with Howard. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, there are, 1% uh, of the diabetes population has a genetic cause, and that should drive different therapies for them. And there are 13 different that, kinds of that. That we of know that. of. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That we know of. That we know of. Right. And, right. And, and that doesn't sound like a big number. But well, that's, that half a, that's a half a million people in the United States. Because there are 50 million diabetics mm -hmm. and 1% of 50 million is 500,000. And so, so that's a pharmacogenomic challenge in a different way because it's mm -hmm. disease-based pharmacogenomics. But it's certainly something that... John wants to hear about it, and I, and I think that, that, that it, it, it's an interesting example because it does represent the sort of intersection between rare, not so rare disease and targeted drug therapies that are not, that had nothing to do with the pharmacogenetics, sorry, the pharmacokinetics piece that we spent a lot of time talking about, but, but make, but are rational nevertheless, and I think would be easier for an adoption pathway than than clopidogrel, for example. You, you make an excellent point, Dan, and, and you know, we, we do I have an Ignite. Made it earlier. As always. Um, and, and we do have an Ignite project that is trying to identify those monogenic forms of disease, of, uh, of diabetes. And I'm, I'm just, it occurs to me, you know, if, if as part of the workup of a new diabetic, you not only got the anti, anti GABA, whatever it is, antibodies, GAD antibodies, um, which everybody tests, uh, but, it, but at least looked at one of these genes. I mean, Dick, you, you know, you and I treat hypertensives. When you diagnose a new hypertensive, you're supposed to get a renal ultrasound to make sure you're not missing renal, or, you know, renal hypertension. How often do you see that? It happens, but it's rare. Um, you're supposed to, you know, test urinary metanephrines. Pardon me? And no, it hasn't. Uh, urinary metanephrines, every, every hypertensive is supposed to get this. Um, but we don't, we don't do testing for, for sort of basic uh, uh, genes that, that lead, lead to these diseases. Yeah. In all honesty, I think we're surely, not because we thought about it this way at the beginning, in pharmacogenomics, because of the PK side, which is the place we started because we had a phenotype we could measure easily in its quantitative and its blood drug levels, we have a spectrum of genes that, have, that are totally impervious to the way we organize medicine. That is, 2D6 is found in psychiatry, 
tamoxifen in breast cancer. It's all over the place because these genes are drug metabolizing, uh, uh, genes encoding drug metabolizing enzymes and transporters. So this is one area of genomics that basically covers every discipline in medicine in one way or another, to varying degrees of our current understanding. Now, Dan's right. We're going to move increasingly to the pharmacodynamic side, and we're going to find, I remember when someone explained to me in words of one syllable that receptors aren't going to show variation because unlike drug metabolizing enzymes, God made them, they're really important as opposed to <laughs> what, what I was doing. So, but they do. So and blocking so, those receptors will, yeah, yeah. will be fatal. Uh, I understand, Dan, but, but nevertheless, we're going to move increasingly to, to PD, PD side. Frankly, though, what's going to happen, I think, with, and what I've guessed that, that during my career I could say this, is that every patient in academic centers, you're going to have a panel of sequence-based data on the genes we currently have data on, and that's going to happen during a fairly brief time period three to five years. I, I have absolutely no doubt that that's going to happen. And then it's really the infrastructure, building the infrastructure within the institution. Support. The technology of how you do 2D6, which is complex, is not going to really be, and you guys will, will know who does that well. It is really hard, as the people around this table know better than anybody, to build the infrastructure with, if it's not going to be alerts, it won't be alerts, it'll be some way that'll be invisible to the doctor that it, it'll be in the pharmacy someplace and it'll be a hard stop on a prescription if you're going to, if it's TPMT, star 3A, star 3A, and then go back and ask for an alternative drug. So I think you're going to see this very quickly, which is why I made those provocative comments about clinical genomics for everyone everywhere. Because I really think that you're asking a good question and I can't say how happy I am to have somebody who understands the mind of the payer and what they're concerned about and uh, seated at this table. So John's done us all a big favor, and, and I want to thank him too. Mm -hmm. But I think the timeline is going to be very rapid. And that's been driven by a lot of things out of the NIH. I wasn't just gratuitously saying that yesterday. Without eMERGE, without the PGR, and we, none of us would be having this. But the NIH doesn't have the resources to do the implementation. Not really. Mm -hmm. It takes a major investment. You went through that at St. Jude. We've gone through it at Mayo. So, the, But we're going to see that academic medical centers uh, that want the U.S. News and World Report to rate them, even though the CEOs will say we never look at it right, uh, <laughs> they're going to all be doing this. So I think you're seeing, going to see this very quickly, and we need your help to do it right. Great. Thanks, yes, Dick. Just oh, one sorry, final point. Ahead. Thanks, Dick, for that. I appreciate the... Uh, Appreciate the comments. Um, one, one final point. I wouldn't just say useful for payers. I actually think this is useful oh, for everybody. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I would argue this is useful the, for the healthcare system. For the patients. Um, yeah, All exactly. And I, I, I genuinely believe this. Yeah, exactly. It's useful for. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is an inside joke because the, the yeah. PMI has, uh, has changed its name to the All of Us Research Program. And so whenever you talk about all of us, it's like, what are we talking about? But anyway, um, to model future needs not only for, for reimbursement, but for infrastructure, as we heard about, for education. No, I'm just playing. I'm playing. Uh, I, I had one other intriguing question, maybe, and I don't know if it directly affects payers or indirectly affects payers, but I could see it coming down the line as we talk about UPGX. As uh, Dick talked about carrying a card around, there's going to be a portability piece. Uh, consumers, um, health systems are going to want to port this data, uh, genomic data that, as we all keep saying, only has to be done once, especially once we get to sequencing data. And I don't know where that plays into it, but I think it's uh, coming down the line. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, actually. I would. Oh, sorry, uh, I was just going to say I would keep the capital A and U in that as well because I think if we're successful, we will actually um, enable all of us to implement. Good point. Okay. We, yeah. uh, Steve, and I should just say we are, we are aiming to end at three as as promised. So, uh, but go ahead. So I was just going to uh, extend what Dick was saying to even further to the uh, realm of totally off the wall. And, you know, kind of part of this um, discussion is we, we talk about patients as everybody else but the people in this, in this room. And it got me to thinking um, my institution is, uh, is self-insured. And Lynn said that uh, mission was self-insured. 
And I wonder how many of our home institutions who are investing heavily in pharmacogenomics are prepared to uh, um, do a pharmacogenome or a panel on each of their employees and see if it makes a difference in their costs over a, a five-year period. Uh, I'm going to actually go back to, uh, to, to my in institution. We are, uh, I think, 7,500 employees. I think we could do our targeted um, uh, next-gen panel for maybe 50 bucks a pop. I wonder how that stacks up against the, um, the uh, um, annual physical that's provided uh, uh, free, uh, the vaccinations, and some of these other, other costs. Might we get, the, might we get uh, uh, some data for the study that uh, NIH won't fund from our own institutions? Just so, a rhetorical so, question. So we've actually looked at that. We have a self-insurance program that's not UF-wide, and it's called Gator Care. Um, and we pulled data on the drug Gator use. Care. It's called Gator Care. <laughs> the, the best we, in veterinary medicine. We, <laughs> we, we, have a, we have an excellent vet school. Um, but we pulled the data on drug use in the Gator Peric population, which is um, physicians, Shands Hospital employees, Athletic Association. Um, they are healthier than the people that are in the Vanderbilt database and in the eMERGE database. And so we have, we have, because that's exactly what we were going to do. And then we decided that it might not, that might not be our best test case because their drug use is actually much lower than sort of the average person because they're well educated and probably healthier. Um, so you might want to look at that before you jump on that. <laughs> but there's sure also that uh, issues of safe harbor in the sense that uh, you'll be hit by Gina twice as an insurer and as an employer if you don't do it correctly. Mm. Well, and, and Marilyn stepped out of the room, but, but the Penn State experience on uh, encouraging their, their faculty and, and staff to be genotyped, um, uh, we, we, I think there was a financial incentive to that, if I recall correctly, <coughs> that, that they would get a lower insurance rate if they, if they uh, had genetic testing. And they got in all kinds of trouble. You don't know. Okay. Maybe I'm hallucinating. It often happens. Um, there was another comment. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. So the chances of uh, pharmacogenetic uh, implementation to a community type of health providers would increase within five years if the research community could provide, and forgive me what I'm going to say in my next statement, because I think the list of gene drug target is not extremely impressive. So if the research community could generate more uh, such a target. More exciting drugs and genes? Yeah. Yes. So yeah. what, what we'll I'm see what we could do about that. Mm, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm suggesting, well, the mm. body like this, maybe we could develop, cast this, the net to, to catch new, new targets. Mm -hmm. And my suggestion would be, for example, anti-hypertension uh, uh, pharmacogenomics, which I think it's, it's a very fertile area. Mm -hmm. Because like in my institution, it's a huge institution, 16th hospital, 160. But if I would show them the list for the administration, I might say they may, would be hard to impress them and, and mobilize. You should have them talk to Mark and Steve and a couple of, of others. Uh, I, bet, I bet you'd have good arguments to make for, or Dan, um, for, for implementing, you know, even the list, the unimpressive list we have so far, you can avoid some pretty important uh, adverse reactions. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I don't know that it's for a dint of uh, looking. Uh, I think that um, the, the reason that you see the the, the drugs on the list is because they're the ones for which we have the largest signal of effect size. And uh, so I don't think it's because we haven't looked at hypertension or the SSRIs or that sort of thing, but we're just not finding as much that moves the needle as significantly as we're seeing with clopidogrel and warfarin and, and, and that. Um, so I think that's one of the pragmatic reasons that we've sort of initiated focus on that, even though the point that you make is well taken, which is we're treating way more people with hypertension and diabetes. And so even if we find effect sizes that are somewhat more modest in the pharmacogenomic realm, they might in fact have a larger cumulative effect if we're able to implement. 
Okay, I think at, at this point, um, we've probably tapped everyone out. Um, we've worked pretty darn hard in the, in the past uh, two days, and we very much appreciate it. I'm going to leave uh, Mary with the, uh, with the last word, but before we, we get to the last word, just a reminder in terms of, of next steps. Um, our colleagues uh, here, uh, Milpi and, and um, Ellen and Colette, who, who was here yesterday, will be writing up a summary of the meeting. We will send it around uh, to, to all the participants um, and ask for a rather quick turnaround uh, on it. It's a, a summary that basically goes on our website and says, here's what we talked about. You can see some of them on, from our previous meetings. Uh, we usually do an executive summary that's a one to two page, you know, here's the key stuff and then, and then maybe 10 pages um, uh, of other stuff. Uh, and then following that, we would very much like to put together a manuscript. Uh, my colleague Simona Volpe has volunteered or been volunteered to, to lead that. Uh, and and with, with Mary and me, we hope to get uh, a draft out to you uh, in, the, in the next six weeks or so. Um, so that would be our, our target. And, and having said it publicly, it gives it a little bit more uh, force. But recognizing that all of us are busy, uh, we'll, do, we'll do the best we can with that. We would ask for your um, uh, responses back uh, within a, about a two to three week window. We usually have two or three, about one or two back and forths on these things, and then we submit them. Uh, Target Journal, probably Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics, which is the group that, that publishes the CPIC guidelines, um, if they'll have us. So, and uh, just a reminder that you do need to respond in order to be included. So I think with that, Mary, you have the last word. Well, um, I guess, Terry, thank you and all of the staff. Um, you don't have the last word. Okay. Thanking the staff. Yes. yes. So I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> so, um, so very important. And Jeff, you can tell me who I've forgotten, but, but particularly Kim Davis, who is outside the room. Um, but who did a fabulous job in, in keeping us all organized, and Teji particularly, who kept us all excruciatingly organized. <laughs> Alvaro and uh, Mukul, who are, are doing the, uh, the videotaping and, and webcasting for today, uh, and anyone else. Uh, oh, I already made, well, and, and of course, Melpi and, and Colette and, um, and Ellen, who are, who are taking our notes. So, so many thanks to you all. <laughs> Now you can. And also to thank um, the Gen Genomic Medicine Working Group who talked about this meeting for many, many months at our regular um, conference calls. Um, and to all of you for participating. I mean, when I look back over our objectives, I think we really did get a survey of the landscape of what's going on in pharmacogenomics um, in, in a way that uh, has been really helpful to me, bringing this many people together in this room who are really doing some of the cutting edge research. Um, we, we talked a lot about limitations. Um, if you remember, my very first slide was on the hype. Um, and I do think that the, that last question helps to illustrate, you know, there is a tremendous hype about pharmacogenomics. Um, there, there are horrible adverse drug reactions and there's an unacceptably high percentage of patients who don't respond to medications the way that we would like them to. And we do have to keep in mind that pharmacogenomics is probably not going to solve the majority of those problems, but it is going to solve a significant minority of the problems that we have. And the point is that we have the knowledge, we increasingly have the genotyping, we just need to put in place the processes to do the implementing, and I commend all of you for doing what you are doing because many of you are making tremendous progress in implementing genetic testing to improve patient care to the extent that we can, and obviously sharing your information with everybody else, which is really great. And to thank NIH and especially NHGRI for um, supporting the work, because they've definitely planted the seed for us to do what we've done. So thank you. Sure. Thank you. All right. Safe travels Safe home. home.